The Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, supporting inclusive higher education and healthcare, vibrant spiritual communities, and a clean environment. The Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, investing in our common future. Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this local event for our newest film, Muhammad Ali. Storytelling is at the heart of public media, and this story brings to life one of the best known and indelible figures of the 20th century, a man who insisted on being himself unconditionally, becoming an inspiration to people everywhere. We appreciate the support of your local public television station, which makes it possible for us to tell complicated and in-depth stories like this one. Thank you for being here today. Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening for an enlightening and we hope thought-provoking conversation about Muhammad Ali. My name is Dr. J. Michael Butler, and I'm the Keenan Distinguished Professor of History at Flagler College, where I've taught since 2008. My area of focus is Southern cultural history with an emphasis on the civil rights movement. And I teach a number of classes on the topics and have published in a few videos as well, but enough about me. I'm honored to serve as the moderator for this event and would like to introduce you to our distinguished panel for the evening's conversation. First, Dr. Parvez Ahmed is Professor of Finance. UNF. Dr. Ahmed, welcome. Our next panelist is Ismail Reed. Mr. Reed is a prolific author of novels. Emeritus Awardee. Dr. Mr. Reed is one of a handful of authors nominated for two National Book Awards in the same year, received the Otto and Ofdelco Awards for Theater, and was featured in the Best American Poetry 2019. He is the author of The Complete Muhammad Ali, which includes material and photographs not seen in most of the hundreds of other books written about the champion. Mr. Reed, thank you for joining us. A few notes before we start. First, a word regarding our program schedule. We're going to spend the first part of the event watching clips from Muhammad Ali, the coming documentary on Jacksonville PBS, and then we will talk about Muhammad Ali. Then we would like to get to your questions. So please submit your questions in the chat as we go, and be sure to let us know where you're joining us from. Second, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor for this evening's event, the Author Vining Davis Foundation. So now, touch gloves, go to our respective corners, and watch a clip from the new documentary, Muhammad Ali. You want some breakfast? Do you want some breakfast? I want some food. Can I have something to eat? Oh, I don't want none. I won't take none. I won't take none. I won't eat none if you don't want to. Oh, look at that pretty horse. Oh, is that a white horse? See? Now stand up. Look over there. Stand up. You got to stand up over that bill. See the big one? There he is. 
My earliest memories that I can think of as a child with my father are walking through airports and being in crowds and, and feeling in my vibrations of people's clapping and shouts in my chest and just looking at my dad, you know, like, who is this person? All the time, anywhere we went, you're the greatest, we love you, and the clapping, and Muhammad. I loved feeling all the energy and the love that he felt. We now think of Muhammad Ali as this vulnerable guy lighting the torch in Atlanta, and everybody on the globe loves him. Black people like him, white people. He's a universal hero, like almost in a religious way, like the Buddha. But when he was in the midst of his career, and not just in the early bit, he was incredibly divisive. Boo, yell, scream, throw peanuts, but whatever you do, pay to get in. People hated him, whether it was along racial lines, class lines, Vietnam lines, political lines, religious lines, where they just couldn't stand him. And people, of course, had the opposite. And this was, I loved him, loved him. But you had an opinion about him. Look how pretty I am. Along with trim legs and a beautiful arms and a pretty nose and mouth. I know I'm a pretty man. I know I'm pretty. You don't have to tell me I'm pretty. I'm cocky, I'm proud. Never talk about who's gonna stop me. Well, ain't nobody gonna stop me. I say what I wanna say. Ain't no more big talk like this. He was a pioneer. He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. A guy known simply as the greatest. I am the greatest. I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I can drown the drink of water and kill a dead tree. This will be no contest. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. I'm away, I'm away. To have that chutzpah and to be a black man in America was just, it was outlandish. Muhammad means worthy of all praises, and Ali means most high. And I just don't think I should go 10,000 miles in here and shoot some black people that never caught me. I just can't shoot it. I always wonder why Miss America was always white. Santa Claus was white. White swan soap, king white soap, white cloud tissue paper, and everything bad was black. Black cat was the bad luck, and if I threaten you, I'm going to blackmail you. <laughs> I said, Mama, why don't they call it white male? They lied too. I love being around him. I love being around Muhammad Ali. You gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Ah, the price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Freedom, freedom, I can't move. Freedom, cut me loose. A winner and still. I'm a keep on running cause the winner don't quit on themselves. He called himself the greatest and then proved it to the entire world. He was a master at what is called the sweet science, the brutal and sometimes beautiful art of boxing. Heavyweight champion at just 22 years old, he wrote his own rules in the ring and in his life, infuriating his critics, baffling his opponents, and riveting millions of fans. At the height of the civil rights movement, he joined a separatist religious sect whose leader would, for a time, dominate both his personal life and his boxing career. He spoke his mind and stood on principle even when it cost him his livelihood. He redefined black manhood, yet belittled his greatest rival using the racist language of the Jim Crow South in which he had been raised. Banished for his beliefs, he returned to boxing an underdog, 
reclaimed his title twice and became the most famous man on earth. He craved adulation his whole life, seeking crowds on street corners, in hotel lobbies, on airport tarmacs, everywhere he went, and reveled in the uninhibited joy he brought each adoring fan. He earned a massive fortune, spent it freely, and gave generously to family, friends, even strangers, anyone in need. Service to others, he often said, is the rent you pay for your room here on Earth. Even after his body began to betray him and his brain had absorbed too many blows, he fought on, unable to go without the attention and drama that accompanied each bout. Later, slowed and silenced by a cruel and crippling disease, he found refuge in his faith becoming a symbol of peace and hope on every continent. Muhammad Ali was, the novelist Norman Mailer wrote, the very spirit of the 20th century. I'm always going to be one black one who got big on your white televisions, on your white newspapers, on your satellites, million dollar checks, and still look you in your face and tell you the truth and 100% stay with and represent my people and not leave them and sell them out because I'm rich and stay with them. That was my purpose. I'm here and I'm showing the world that you can be here and still free and stay yourself and get respect from the world. From my perspective, anytime Muhammad Ali is mentioned, there are a number of different opinions that are given, whether it's students, whether it's parents, whether it's people who watch him box or people who had never seen a fight at all. My question for the panel is starting with Dr. Ahmed, what do you think makes Muhammad Ali such a compelling figure? left boxing although during his boxing career he was he was bigger than almost any athlete that lived during his time i'll give you just one quick example of what he meant to people who had never seen him box and that would be me actually the first time i saw him box was in 1978 uh, when he was getting ready for his rematch with leon spinks uh, when he won back the title for the third uh, and final time. The reason I had never seen him box before that, because in India, where I was uh, born and raised, there was no television that was broadcasting his fights before that time. Even in 1978, there was no live broadcast of Ali's fight. It was being broadcast in Bangladesh, and my city of Calcutta, or Kolkata now, is just a few hundred miles away from Dhaka. And one of my friend, one of my dad's friends, he had jigged his antenna so he could essentially steal the feed from Bangladesh TV. And we huddled around his TV in grainy pictures, mesmerized watching Ali fight. And that was the first time. And yet he, he had occupied and outsized um, life inside my own brain and in my own heart, only just by reading about his fights. So just this, the description of his fights, the what he said during the fights or before the fight or after the fight, had already become legend in parts of the world that had never seen a single fight of Ali. And I think that's, that's the remarkable testament of a sports figure. Because when we think about sports, it is all about watching the live action and, and, being, and being mesmerized by a Tom Brady, a LeBron James, or whoever, uh, a Messi. But to grow up uh, idolizing somebody, having never watched them actually put on a display of their sport, sporting prowess is a remarkable testimony 
to an athlete that I don't think so the world has ever seen before or will ever see again. What do you think makes Muhammad Ali such a compelling figure? The uh, script was not balanced. It uh, seemed to idealize uh, the champion. And uh, I wonder who wrote the script. Uh, number two, I think that uh, Ali mastered the showbiz techniques of, of a wrestler named Gorgeous George. Gorgeous George was a wrestler in the 1950s. And he played the villain, he played the heavy. And he was, he boasted a lot, you know, in appearance. And that was a box office draw. And I think that uh, Muhammad Ali learned how to, to manipulate the the box office, television. Uh, he was one of the first television boxers, except in the 1940s, uh, Gillette used to sponsor fights every night on television. But he's the one who mastered the medium. Now, as far as his being his own man, uh, Ali followed orders. Uh, when he was under the uh, guidance of uh, Minister Elijah Muhammad, he followed his orders. And then when he became a member of uh, Elijah Muhammad's uh, successor, Wallace Muhammad, he followed those orders. So in terms of being his own man, that's very questionable. And I think the the crucial point, as far as his having his own autonomy, was when Malcolm X broke from Minister Elijah Muhammad. He went with Elijah Muhammad, who was sort of like a father figure for him. So I think, uh, first of all, I think the script was not balanced. It sounds like it was written by, <laughs> I'm sorry, a groupie. Uh, and it sort of like uh, it erases all the warts and applause uh, in the champion's uh, life. So, and I don't think that at the very beginning there was time to get into the, a lot of the complexities that makes him this interesting figure that I believe he is uh, historically. Um, there was a quote that I thought was really poignant. The playwright Norman Mailer, the novelist Norman Mailer, uh, gave the, the interesting line, quote, that Muhammad Ali was the, quote, very spirit of the 20th century. What do you think, what do you think he means by that? Well, the question is, what do you think he meant by that? And how could it be perceived that he was the spirit of the 20th century, or maybe not. Uh, Dr. Ahmed. In my view, uh, his, um, in my view, he was an embodiment of the 20th century, partly because uh, he was a man of contradictions. Um, as my fellow panelist, Mr. Reed, just pointed out, um, the, the, he he lived with contradiction, and the 20th century was was full of contradictions. On one hand, there was a yearning for democracy. The democracy did spread far and wide uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, it, many countries uh, got out of the yoke of colonialism um, and were able to become free uh, free nations. And yet, uh, the quest for justice was incomplete, including in our own country. And Ali embodied that. I remember a time when Ali actually visited my my birth city of Kolkata, India, and he was uh, he was interviewed by one of the local boxing referees, and he uh, mentioned to him 
when the referee brought up that you know how, uh, who was the greatest of all time and uh, ali responded by saying only god is the greatest uh, although his own self description that i am the greatest is what defines him defines his legacy and yet in his later life he was much more circumspect much more humble um in in understanding that from let's say from an islamic perspective when we say the greatest uh the greatest is only ascribed to god um and and so ali lived with those contradictions a man of deep spirituality and faith and yet he ascribed to himself a title that would be um that would be blasphemous within islamic traditions um and yet he was beloved by muslims uh because muslims un- and he himself understood it and muslims around the world understood him uh that he was not claiming to be god uh he was simply using that as a way to rebel against a system uh that was uh not living up to its ideals the america of 1960s and and ali's childhood and youth uh was certainly not living up to his ideals even today america is not living uh, living up to its ideals so it's it's a it's in a constant perpetual motion to move towards the more perfect union um and that journey still continues so the i i, I do agree with the, the the description that normal mailer uh, set out that he embodied 20th century because 20th century was full of contradictions although probably norman made it uh, meant it uh in, in a slightly different way than 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 i'm i'm thinking about it <clears throat> mr reed i'll turn the question to you how what would make mr mailer reach the conclusion whether you agree with it or not that this is a man who does represent the very spirit of the 20th century well sticks of marijuana i mean norman mailer i call him just incoherent who says a lot of over the top of things and indulges in hyperbole and sometimes it's hard to dissect the point that he's making now in terms of Ali representing democracy he had not with dictators Mobutu of the Congo or Zaire Marcos of the Philippines although I did interview uh, Emil Guillamo who's a Filipino journalist who said that uh it was the Ali Fraser fight that brought uh, the Philippines into the 20th century and in terms of being beloved by Muslims all over the world in the beginning the orthodox Muslims rejected the nation of Islam and members of the nation of Islam who I interviewed don't uh share that affection for Ali as a matter of fact they call him a hypocrite when he got into that dispute with the Lazar Muhammad yes i believe that the contradictions that we've all touched upon and what he represented to a variety of different people at different times in his life sort of represents the complexities of america in the 21st century uh the 20th century going into the 21st century so i think representing the spirit of something much greater than yourself and all of the contradictions that that entails that that can absolutely represent a figure that was so universally recognized. Wow, I'm looking forward to the next batch of conversations. This is going to be a, an interesting evening. But for now, let's watch another clip from episodes 2 and 3 of Muhammad Ali. Two weeks later, an all-white Houston jury found Ali guilty of refusing the draft. The judge, ignoring the more lenient recommendation of the prosecutor, sentenced him to the maximum: five years in prison and a ten thousand dollar fine. And he would have to surrender his passport. Ali's lawyers immediately filed an appeal, prepared to go all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. a process that could take years Ali remained free but without his title or a license to box He fully expected that he would one day go to jail for his beliefs 
we, who are followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, we believe in obeying the laws of the land. We are taught to obey the laws of the land as long as it don't conflict with our religious beliefs. Will you go into service as such? This would be a thousand percent against the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the religion of Islam, and the Holy Quran, the holy book that we believe in. This will all be denouncing and defying everything that I stand for. This would mean, of course, that you stand the chance of going to jail as a result of not going into service. You well, whatever the punishment, whatever the persecution is for standing up for my religious beliefs, even if it means facing machine gun for that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. When I think about him saying, if they want to put me before a firing squad tomorrow, I'm ready to die before I abandon my religion. Um, that's it. You can't teach that kind of thing in lectures, in books. That kind of thing has to be modeled. And models turn into traditions. And traditions provide people with the mechanical memory to do the right thing. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. I mean, anybody now faced with a major decision in which the right way is clear and the wrong way is clear, but the consequences are dire, now they have a model that they can fall back on psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. That's what Muhammad Ali represented in that moment. And that to me, that moment will live on forever. We're back and the Next set of comments will be in direct reflection to what we just saw regarding Muhammad Ali. Oh. Is there a feedback coming through? The next question that I wanted to ask was about the conscientious objector status that Muhammad Ali received or used in his decision to refuse induction into the United States Army. How did that decision resonate then? And why is it still a topic that many fans, observers, and scholars go back to as forming their opinion of who Muhammad Ali was. Mr. Reed, let's start with you this time. Who was the one who brought Muhammad Ali into the nation of Islam in Florida. Uh, Muhammad Ali had seen Abdul Rahman selling Muhammad speaks and he began to question Rock on about uh, the philosophy of Islam, uh, the nation of Islam. They were uh, in a home where the sisters were cooking for them. The press was outside, and he asked Abdul Rahman what he should tell the press. And Abdul Rahman said, "Go out and tell them that you know the famous statement: No Vietnamese ever called me the N word." And that's what he did. Now, what's not mentioned in this documentary? is Elijah Muhammad's experience with the draft. Elijah Muhammad was considered so pro-Japanese that they tried him for sedition. And when that didn't work, they got him for draft dodging. He spent four, four years on an agricultural farm where he acquainted himself with the techniques of farming. Um, not many people know there were more Black people who were members of a uh, Japanese uh, pro-Japanese fronts and communist fronts. And that's because when the Japanese uh, defeated the Russian Navy in 1905, uh, that was considered a heroic act by uh, Black people like W. Du Bois and others, George Schuyler. And uh, it came so that uh, the uh, FBI wanted to charge them with sedition. 
the new black newspapers. There's, there's a book called The Question, The Question of Sedition. So it was Elijah Muhammad who made that the precedent, and uh, Nation of Islam members or followers followed that. Muhammad Ali being one of them. Now, in terms, just hold, just hold, just hold on one second. In terms of facing guns and, and physical threats, it was Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson, Jackie Robinson, and Sonny Liston, who faced white men with guns and fought them with their fists, yet they're considered Uncle Toms. I think that there is a, a, a clarification that we need to make because we have had discussions about Muhammad Ali, the student of Islam, and Muhammad Ali, the member of the Nation of Islam. Those are very different things. So, Mr. Reed, from a non-expert's perspective, how would you explain in layman's terms what the Nation of Islam was and when Muhammad Ali broke with that sect? I don't know if you call it a sect. Uh, the Nation of Islam it was probably what one might consider a workers' cooperative, that uh, they pooled their money and invested it in property like farms. As a matter of fact, the their advisor, uh, the person who was an expert on farming and agriculture, was a Harvard graduate. A lot of people uh, stereotype the members of the Nation of Islam as being members of the working class, but they had scientists and uh, scholars who 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 were were members. Now, uh, Elijah Muhammad broke with the the Yaqub legend. You know the idea that. A black scientist created white people for evil in 1974. And a pivotal moment came with the assassination of JFK. That's when Malcolm X broke with uh, the nation, Elijah Muhammad's nation, because he made a remark about that and mocked it. The chickens come home to roost instead of JFK's death. He was reprimanded and suspended by Elijah Muhammad because Elijah Muhammad, this is essentially a commercial group, and didn't want to bring the heat of the government on them. So uh, after uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad died, uh, he was succeeded by his son, Wallace Muhammad, and Elijah, uh, Muhammad Ali merely followed Wallace. Right. Thank you for that. Dr. Ahmad, uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask is along the same lines about Muhammad Ali's refusal when he was in the Nation of Islam to be inducted into the United States military at the height of the Vietnam War. Is this part of his reputation that you knew about growing up in India, or was it something that you learned about later, and how did that influence the way that you viewed Muhammad Ali from when you were a child and first learned about him? Uh, no, we knew about that. That part of his life was no, very, very well known, and um, and um, it was a conscientious objection that was very highly regarded and respected. Um, there is a uh, there is a tradition uh, within the Islamic faith um, when one is confronted with a challenge to their beliefs, how should they respond to that? And the tradition comes from a story about Prophet Muhammad, um, God's peace be upon him, um, that when he was in the early stages of propagating his faith, in his early stages of his ministry, uh, the, the elites of Mecca, who were the establishment of Mecca, the power establishment of Mecca, they came to Prophet Muhammad and asked him to renounce his faith renounced the new faith that he was preaching. And they sent his uncle, who was one of the nobles of that time, uh, to him uh, to persuade him to give up um, his faith. And Prophet Muhammad responded that if they put the sun on my right hand and the moon on my left hand, I will not give up this faith. So it is a tradition that many Muslims are very intimately aware of on how they should respond to when somebody challenges their most sacredly held belief. 
now whether joining an army uh whether joining a nation's army um is part of a or when one should join and when one should be a conscientious objection that is not really clear in 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 the religious sense the religion itself would say that if your country is in a war and asks you to join that war then you should join um although it leaves room open for interpretation that there would be situations where conscientious objection would be the right thing to do in terms of uh how this was perceived outside i think it was perceived in that in that manner that while it is understood that a person should um join their nation's army when that army is in a battle when their country is in a battle but it also leaves open a room for conscientious objection but again here is another contradiction in ali's life you know what would what would be considered you know treason or uh, unpatriotic by not joining the army on the flip side when ali later in his life would visit many muslim majority country he would speak glowingly about america and his americanness despite being discriminated despite losing the ability to fight at the peak of his career perhaps losing uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in that process um he never was bitter about his country um he always spoke glowingly about his americanness and what it meant to be an american and he kind of played the bridge builder role while he was talking about uh in his own country talking to his fellow countrymen on how they should understand islam and muslims better particularly after 9/11 he was visiting other countries and asking them to understand america better and he played the role of a bridge builder uh, and the contradiction that was innate to him is also part of uh, america's cultural tradition america's foreign policy tradition um and that contradiction is something that we always struggle to reconcile of who Ali the person was. Um Mr. Reed, yes. To the right. Uh he he endorsed uh, Ronald Reagan. And we're still suffering from that regime. We're still living in the age of neoliberalism liberalism and selfishness. The sort of like followers of Ayn Rand. We're still in that period. And that was begun by Ronald Reagan yet uh Muhammad Ali endorsed Ronald Reagan and he accepted an award uh from George Bush who was inflicting a great deal of damage uh in the Middle East, Middle East and causing uh, hundreds of thousands of casualties and he uh was uh criticized uh for that so um yes i think that uh the nation of islam and uh the those successors of Elijah Muhammad are probably considered conservative and as a matter of fact the FBI said that they were nothing to worry about it was a lot, it was Martin Luther King who was causing the trouble and i think if there's anybody who embodies the spirit of the 20th century is Martin Luther King because he he was in physical danger every day of his life while his critics weren't oh i totally agree with that um for, from my perspective as a historian from a cultural historian's perspective I think that his objection to the Vietnam War was more in line of him living the creed that I am not who you want me to be. And to understand that you have to understand that this was a, a young man who came to age in the Jim Crow South, an age in which blacks were in all areas made subordinate to white by law, by custom, by practice, and by violence. I think that everything that we've mentioned thus far is a rebellion against that notion of second class citizenship that Ali and millions of other black southerners had to live under the idea that as a black person who is public you are to be seen and not heard what did muhammad ali do he mimicked gorgeous george he said to draw heat to draw negative attention i'm pretty i'm pretty I'm beautiful. Black people did not boast. 
They did not brag in a Jim Crow world. They knew their place. They acted accordingly, especially in Louisville, Kentucky, when you have white benefactors who are supporting you on the way up. Every step along the way, from the fact that he bucked Jim Crow defiantly by saying, I am the greatest, I'm pretty, I shook up the world, all the way to his entering the nation of Islam, when many other African Americans said, you're letting us down, you're leading us down the wrong path, the nation of Islam was viewed by most of the nation at the time as a black hate group, not the case. But there were many African Americans who believed that as well. He bucked that trend. When it came time to declare himself a conscientious objector, there were many, including Joe Lewis, who basically said, no, your first duty is to your country. And he said, no, my first obligation is to Allah. You know, I think Mr. Reed brings up a great point that's worth considering, and that is, can you be a person who is your own man, and can you be a person simultaneously who takes orders from what you perceive as true moral authority. And I think these contradictions, which are rooted in the socio and cultural atmosphere of the Jim Crow South, is a link that we can see shape Muhammad Ali throughout his life. Again, touching on our themes of religion and race and history and complexity and conservatism and liberalness. The conversation will continue, but first, we need to watch a final clip from episode four of Muhammad Ali. His devotion to Islam increasingly shaped his daily routine. He prayed five times each day, facing Mecca called friends to discuss the differences between religions and distributed autographed pamphlets that he hoped would help correct common misperceptions about his faith. When he traveled in the Muslim world, massive crowds greeted him as Muhammad Ali Clay to distinguish their hero from thousands of faithful Muslims also named Muhammad Ali. During a goodwill visit to Pakistan in 1987, Muhammad and Lani visited schools, hospitals, and mosques. They delivered canned milk to an Afghan refugee camp along the border and encouraged guerrilla fighters there in their long struggle to evict the occupying Soviet army from Afghanistan. He needed love like he needed air to breathe. So the people did probably more for him than he did for them, if not at least equal. You know, so he was so grateful for the love they gave. He was so grateful for that. In 1989, he was on the road more than at home, visiting England, Senegal, Switzerland, and Saudi Arabia. In April, he and Lani made a pilgrimage to Mecca during the holy month of Ramadan. Ali had visited Mecca before, in 1972, but now admitted that he hadn't fully appreciated its significance and acknowledged that his commitment to his religion had long been imperfect. I fit my religion to do whatever I wanted. I did things that were wrong and chased women all the time. Everything I do now, I do to please Allah. One of my father's favorite sayings was, rivers, lakes, and streams all have different names, but they all contain water. So do religions have different names, but they all contain truth. He always taught me that there's only one true religion, and that's the religion of the heart, he would say. And as long as you do right and you treat people right, you know, I believe you'll go to heaven no matter what you call your religion. Ali, late in life, talked about this tallying angel, he called it, that there was an angel up there who counted all the good things you did in life and all the bad things you did in life. And if you had more bad things than good things, you were going to hell. And he had a very vivid impression of what hell meant. And he acknowledged that he had a lot of negative marks, that the tallying angel was not going to be uh, happy with the way he had treated women in particular. 30 years after Ali first faced Joe Frazier, a reporter asked him about their long-running feud. 
I called him a lot of names that I shouldn't have called him, Ali admitted. I apologize for that. I like Joe Frazier. Me and him was a good show. Frazier never forgave Ali. Later, he expressed sorrow at having abandoned Malcolm X. Turning my back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes that I regret most in my life, he wrote. I wished I'd been able to tell Malcolm I was sorry that he was right about so many things. Daddy evolved, he became better. And Daddy said that I'm bigger than boxing. That meant boxing was this much. His evolution into the person he is today is way bigger than him just boxing. And I think he knew that. And he carried it with him, his love. And he gave it to every single person he met. And I think that's beautiful. As the 20th century came to an end, Newsweek, Time, and Sports Illustrated all named him Athlete of the Century. In the days after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American Muslims were the victims of hate crimes simply because of their faith. I am a Muslim. I am an American, Ali responded. If the culprits are Muslim, they have twisted the teachings of Islam. Whoever performed the terrorist attacks does not represent Islam. God is not behind assassins. What I hope is that Muhammad Ali will be a constant reminder uh, uh, to America of just how thoroughly American a believing, practicing, sincerely committed Muslim can be. Whatever one's background is, Ali belongs to America, all of us. And I think that he belongs to all of us because he affected all of us. And I hope that that's part of the legacy that he will leave, that America won't forget Ali as this American Muslim with, with equal emphasis on American Muslim. On November 9th, 2005, President George W. Bush presented Ali with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. That same year, the Muhammad Ali Center, a museum dedicated to his life and legacy, opened in Louisville. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to reach us a certain way and to move America in a certain way, and to move individuals in a certain way. I'm going to take this path. I believe that I'm right. And even if I'm not right, I'm still me. And to be able to follow that and to know that there was going to be an enormous price to pay for that and to have that be generational, to have that live on beyond you is extremely valuable. Everything that he did couldn't be undone. Welcome back for our final round of questions before we open it up to you, the audience, for one of my favorite parts of these roundtable discussions, and that is the Q&A session. We have used a lot of words to describe Muhammad Ali in this very brief conversation. I wrote a few down, hyperbole, misconceptions, complexity, faith, identity, religion, and not once have we used the term boxer. Muhammad Ali was first and foremost an athlete. It's probably one of the th things that drew the most attention to him, at least initially. So with that in mind, I have sort of a softball personal question and then a much more reflective question before we open it up to our Q&A. The first question is, is there a fight, a rivalry, a series of matches that are your favorite? in the Muhammad Ali canon, and why? 
is that the case? Mr. Reed, let's start with you. Well, I saw him box in uh, Madison Square Garden in the early 60s, and he lost the fight. He fought Doug Jones, and Doug Jones beat him. But I thought that uh, the promoters who have ruined boxing, and I think television has ruined boxing, they saw this personality and this telegenic personality who could draw crowds. And so they gave him that one. That was uh, a gift. I, I agree with uh, Emmanuel Stewart, whom I interviewed for my book, the great trainer, said he should have quit after the Foreman fight. I thought that was his greatest triumph. And in that fight, you could see that people talk about the rope and dope. Well, I think he no longer had the ability to dance around and use other techniques. That's the reason for the rope and uh, And then after that, his uh, skills began to deteriorate. I talked to Mark Gibson, a sports writer, black sports writer, who said that uh, when he fought uh, Larry Holmes, he didn't even train. And so he just became, he just began, began to deteriorate and get hit a lot. So after that three year layoff, it's slowed down, just like Roy Jones. When, when Roy Jones slowed down, slowed down and lost his speed, he got knocked out. So I just think he's a person who, who stayed in the ring too long and uh, suffered from the effects. I don't think that was Parkinson's disease. I think that was uh, dementia brought about by too many blows in the head. Encounter with Ali in Africa, and uh, Muhammad Ali had mocked him as being a holy man, but in the end, Muhammad Ali became a holy man. He sort of like had universal religious acceptance, not only by Muslims, but by Buddhists and members of other religions. And in terms of being an ambassador, uh, you know, George, uh, excuse me, George. Um, Jimmy Carter made him an ambassador uh, to Africa, so like a roving ambassador to Africa, and the African leaders saw that as an insult that they would choose a boxer to be an ambassador to their countries. Right. So from that, I'll take it that the George Foreman fight is your favorite Muhammad Ali fight for uh, the reasons that, that that you sort of explained. It was. It was. And when we look historically at the people who Muhammad Ali faced and vanquished, it was some of the biggest, baddest men of the time, right? Uh, they were their generation's Mike Tyson, the Sonny Liston's, the George Foreman's. Dr. Ahmed, I'll ask you the same question. Is there a fight? Is there a series of fights? Or is there an athletic event that you know most about Muhammad Ali? And if so, why? Of course, the athletic event that he will be forever remembered is the one where he did not perform as an athlete, which was when he lit the Olympic flame at the Los Angeles Olympics. Um, but I'm not a boxing connoisseur, so I cannot give you the details, the nuances of which particular fight was the most technically sound and, and stuff like that. But in terms of my understanding of his fights, they were all in retrospect. Because after I came to America as a student, graduate student, being the idol that Muhammad Ali was in my life, even before I came to the U.S., I went to Blockbuster Videos at that time on VHS tape and rented his old fights, and that's how I started watching his old fights. To me, of course, the Foreman fight, you know, because of the location and the and the pageantry surrounding it and the politics surrounding it, will forever remain one of the most iconic fights. Uh, but in terms of what what I took. What, what remained my favorite fight was actually his very first fly fight, which was, or this first major fight, which was even before he was Muhammad Ali, which was the fight against Sonny, Sonny Liston, uh, Liston, because that's where it all started. You know, his, his bravado and his, you know, uh, not only the fight shaped who he was, but he then immediately began to reshape boxing uh, and began to reshape sports. Um, so that, the genesis of Muhammad Ali uh, in that in that list and fight was uh, was always a, always a favorite of mine. Yeah, and that that the reaction to that fight is something that I'll always remember. 
as being one of my first introductions to Ali the athlete. You know, growing up in different regions at different times, as all of our panelists have. Um, what was often said about Muhammad Ali from a working class white Southern background was not very complimentary. Yet, the first athletic footage I remember seeing him in were in commercials in which he was bragging, I shook up the world, I'm pretty, um, I'm a bad man. And that magnetism drew you to it. And I got more and more into the, uh, the, the boxing catalog. Um, I, I'm with Dr. Ahmed and I'm with Mr. Reed. I think both of those fights are defining moments. And that's one of the things about Ali's public career is that there are so many defining moments. Um, the Ernie Terrell fight, 1967 for me, is one of the more interesting. And it adds to the complexity and the misunderstanding of Ali and his opponents. Terrell called him Cassius Clay. They were friends. They had been roommates once upon a time. Muhammad Ali was at the height of being criticized for joining the Nation of Islam and said, that's not my name. My name is Muhammad Ali. Ernie Terrell began to goad him because anything that he could use to get under Muhammad Ali's skin, he did. So he called him Cassius Clay. It was a pretty brutal fight. And by the eighth round, you can see Ali hitting, duck, jab, step back and say, what's my name? Calling him an Uncle Tom between rounds. That on many levels is an introduction to Muhammad Ali, the athlete, Muhammad Ali, the servant of Allah, Muhammad Ali, the self-assertive black man in a segregated society. So to understand Muhammad Ali, I think the 1967 fight with Ernie Terrell is a good place for people to start. Now, for my final question, before we open it up for the Q&A, I said I was going to toss a softball and one that I think would require a little bit of thought. One of my favorite quotes about Muhammad Ali comes from the former Cleveland Brown great Jim Brown. What Jim Brown said is Muhammad Ali did not become America's most beloved athlete until he lost the ability to speak. With that in mind, I want to ask about your reflections on how Muhammad Ali revolutionized or defined the role of the athlete as social commentator in the United States of America. Dr. Ahmed, I'll start with you and move to Mr. Reed. Well, Muhammad Ali defined so many things, redefined so many things. You know, um, his, I was reading a Rolling Stones article where it was uh, suggested that he was hip hop before hip hop. Um, you know, his Louisville lip moniker was, uh, and his ability to rhyme and, 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 and create poetry out of almost in one of the most brutal sports uh, known to mankind um, uh, was, was mesmerizing. Uh, but I think his, today when we look at people like Colin Kaepernick, for example, um, the price he has paid for standing up for social justice. Um, well, Ali was the precursor to that. Uh, and and one of the things that I, I think one of the persons that was a sports commentator, I think I heard him say, and it resonated with me, that uh, Ali did all of these things that he did so that today's athletes don't have to do them. So he was you know, he was willing to pay the price and he did pay the price in ways that I cannot think of anybody else, uh, any modern modern day athlete that has paid the price like he paid. Colin Kaepernick, in, in my mind, comes closest because he lost the ability to play, um, uh, lost, didn't lose his ability to play. He is simply being um, ostracized by the NFL for, uh, for speaking, for standing up for the truth. But he, he has not faced jail time. He has not faced uh, that kind of um, uh, vitriol that, that Ali drew towards himself. Um, so in that sense, he has redefined. And, and, and although he was not the first athlete to buck, uh, stand up against op oppression and tyranny, you know, um, but uh, he was certainly the one that um, galvanized a lot of people, certainly the one that drew the most attention and I think athletics and sports is better off today. There is a 
there is a new level of social consciousness and a social awakening that you see not only among modern day players, but also to some extent among the leagues also. Not to the extent that we would like them to be, but certainly better than where they were um, even, even a few years ago. And I think all of that, all of that journey um, owes a lot of gratitude um, to Muhammad Ali, his life, his legacy, and, and the bold stances he stood for over and over again. Thank you for that. Mr. Reed, same question to you. Did Muhammad Ali revolutionize the idea of the athlete activist? Uh, well, you know, there are a lot of athletes before him, Arthur Ashe and uh, Jack Johnson, uh, Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was very outspoken. If you read my book, I uncovered some uh, quotations and some speeches that Joe Lewis made, which were uh, activists. And he uh, made it made the armed forces a better situation for 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 black soldiers. I mentioned this uh, incident where Joe Lewis got in fight into a fight with uh, the military police in a segregated bus station, and uh, the MP, as we used to call them, the military police, jabbed the nightstick into Joe Lewis's side and told him to move on that this was a segregated bus station. And Joe Lewis said, I'm a soldier just like you. And so before I knew it, Sugar Ray Robinson, before you knew it, Sugar Ray Robinson had one of the MPs on the floor punching him out, and Joe Lewis was punching the other guy. These are armed racists. These are armed racists. These are no threats. And so the fight stopped when somebody said, that's Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis called the White House and complained. And he made, he made the situation for Black people there were a million people fought in World War II, a million black people fought in World War II. He made it, tried to make it easier for them. So there were, Jack Johnson was outstanding and uh, uh, suffered a great deal of vitriol and death threats because of his lifestyle. So he was the first, I think he was probably one of the first who had a big audience uh, because of uh, television. Uh, I, I would say that uh, it was, his wife, Yolanda, I think she should, she ought to be featured more because he never knew how to handle his finances. So the guy, Buffer, who makes the announcement, let's get ready to rumble, he's made more money than Ali during his boxing career. And he borrowed the idea of let's get ready to rumble from Muhammad Ali, who used to say, you know, young man rumble, he and Bildini. He used to have that routine. So he was exploited. So at, even to the end, where one promoter um, was short of $999,000 in paying him for that purse. For the, for the, so he sent Yolanda, his, his wife, to business school. She managed his affairs. And she got him that $50 million contract for the use of his name the same company that uses Elvis Presley's name. So once in a while, you'll see Muhammad Ali in a commercial, or you'll hear the audio of Muhammad Ali in a commercial. So he didn't manage his affairs very well. Now back to that Terrell fight. Terrell was organized crime fighter, and Muhammad Ali was the Nation of Islam's fighter. The Nation of Islam improved the situation of black boxers because they went into the business of boxing. And a showdown, another showdown came with George Shavala, the George Shavala fight in uh, Canada, where organized crimes threatened Ali and said if he won the fight, he found himself at the bottom of Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan and Nation of Islam struck back. So they were among those who challenged, the Nation of Islam challenged, a book, uh, an organization called Main Box, challenged uh, organized crimes reign over boxing. Well, that's a lot of information to digest. Um, a truly complicated figure. I'm glad that you did mention Jack John Johnson. Uh, the Man Act was actually used against him to break him personally, financially, um, and, and yes, 
what I what I do think makes Ali historically unique is that several years of his prime was taken from him, not lost. It was taken from him by the United States government. And he was facing five years in prison, the maximum sentence, even though the jury that convicted him recommended leniency, the judge in Houston, Texas gave him the stiffest penalty possible. And when he was asked, when they learned of the Supreme Court's verdict, unanimous that the case against Muhammad Ali was dismissed, was it the proudest moment in his life or does the system correct itself? You know, something where you expect someone to sort of kowtow and say, yes, thank you, the system works. Muhammad Ali, in his typical boastful way, non-existent said, I can't say if the justice system works because I don't know who's going to be assassinated tonight. Meaning, whatever I face, people who look like me are going to have to face a lot worse in the coming days, months, and years. And I think that no matter who we are or who we idolize or expect to be spokesmen of a generation, whether it's LeBron James in the age of shut up and dribble, right? or whether it's Colin Kaepernick, who has been blackballed, collusion is absolutely evident, that no one will have risked what Muhammad Ali did at the time in American history when he risked it. So, you know, with that in mind, this has been a, a wonderful discussion. I've enjoyed getting to know our panelists a little better and hopefully providing a little bit of context to a really, really deep conversation. But it's time to take some questions from you, the audience. Thank you for bearing with us for this long. And I do believe that we have a list. First, Thomas asks, please reflect on Ali throwing the Olympic gold medal into the Ohio River when he was still so young and still Cassius Clay. Mr. Reed, would you like to comment on that? Well, that story has been disputed, but I, I take uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, word for it. After the Rome Olympics, right? Uh, yes, he did. He did. Um, but yet it was over frustration over being denied service in a segregated restaurant in Louisville, if I'm not mistaken. And that was part of the, he did express regret, but, you know, when we live long enough, we get to rewrite our own mythology. So to Mr. Reed's point, whether or not, you know, you believe that story or not, uh, he did say that it happened. And he was given a replacement medal, I believe, in 1996 as part of his uh, becoming a global citizen, a citizen of the world. And as Dr. Ahmed reminded us, one of his most outstanding feats did not occur in the boxing ring but it was at the 96 Olympics when he lit the torch. Um, Black intellectuals and uh, fans of Ali about that. And they said, well, the, the American public, the mainstream public accepted him because he was no longer the Louisville lip. He, you know, he was no longer the agitator and was feeble. And that's why they accepted that moment, the American public. We have next a comment for the panel to react to. Byrd makes an interesting comment about Ali being an American hero by people who hated him during his prime. I think this is a good comment for Dr. Ahmed to respond to uh, as being someone who may have perceived now the hero's treatment of Muhammad Ali balanced with the historical reality that he was the most hated man in America in 1966 and 67. Dr. Ahmed, what are your insights on that? One level not very different from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. At his time, he was controversial. And now the people that uh, do everything against his ideals also quote him. This is, you know, this there is an element of 
a pop culture element to the way we recall our historical figures. And I think uh, Muhammad Ali and Dr. King, they both embody that. Um, so the people today who may put Muhammad Ali up on a pe pedestal for whatever reason, or idealize him, or quote him, uh, or channel some of his uh, thoughts, um, still do not fully grasp his struggles. And mostly they fail to grasp what Muhammad Ali meant to people who were oppressed, people who were fighting for justice. What does that what does that bond mean? And that and that the fight for justice, the fight for um, equity, is still a monumental struggle in this country. Um, is is missed in 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 many of the uh, in I I personally think we miss it on most MLK days when we celebrate that one day. But then the remainder of the year, we don't live up to MLK's ideals. And the people who come to these celebrations, I'm not casting any aspersions on any particular. But in general, people do a lot of performative um, lip service. Um, and, and I think there is an element of that also when people remember Muhammad Ali or they want to talk about Muhammad Ali or channel Muhammad Ali. The example that, you know, to me that it's it's a reflection that I come to every year, particularly during uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Day, um, is, that, is that the remainder 364 days of the year, we forget about his ideals. We actually, uh, in, 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 in many ways, our system works against the ideals. And yet we celebrate uh his birthday as a holiday it's just like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, again one of those contradictions at one level we can be uh we can think about this contradiction as the richness of america or at another level we can think of this as one of those things that make you go hmm really excellent excellent point um I believe that one of the reasons, historically speaking, that so many people embrace Muhammad Ali today who would have hated him, sometimes the same people from the same families who despised him, now acknowledge he was on the right side of history. Whatever they think about him as a person, the fact that they actually embrace Ali, the mythologized figure, means that they acknowledge he was right. And they were wrong, even though they may not admit it. Yeah. Something along the lines that you just made, because we just went past the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And it, there is an element of that uh, um, the reckoning that I think America goes through quite often. You know, if you remember during the uh, lead up to the Iraq war, the 2003 Iraq invasion, 70% of American public supported the war. A decade later, most of the public were against the war. Same thing with the war in Afghanistan. At the time of the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, there was overwhelming support. Very few people dared to speak out. Voices like us who were, uh, uh, who were suggesting caution and who were saying that, you know, the war in terror cannot really, terrorism cannot really be fought with a war. Um, uh, military intervention alone cannot uh, overcome terrorism. In, and, and people who were agitating for peace um, were brushed aside. But 20 years later, uh, uh, the people who were um, not on the side of these wars have been vindicated over and over again in a way that has extracted uh, enormous cost uh, in, in blood and treasure, um, not only on us as Americans, but also so many people around the world. And it... it, it it is a moment of reflection that we all can uh, use to grow out of it. Um, and we hope that we never make these kind of mistakes again. Um, but something, the cynic within me tells me that, you know, a decade later, we will be discussing another war at another time uh, against another enemy that we very, very, very little understand of. I don't think that's pessimistic. I think that's probably realistic. Uh, we learn from the past. 
often that we learn nothing from the past. Um, so unfortunately, in, in my field, history, there is a phenomenon that's really, really popular now called historical memory. And I think this comes to the point that we've all kind of touched on very, at various points in our conversation. And it's not just history, but it's how has history been remembered and commemorated by subsequent generations, right? So the historical figure and the historical memory around the figure can be totally different. Now, I, I, I brought that up because I wanted to segue into the next insight and question. Um, Steve remarks that Mr. Reed is obviously not a fan. I'll, I'll take it in another direction and say um, he did use the term fanboy to describe a lot of the adulation around uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. With that in mind, the question's twofold. Mr. Reed, why do you think Muhammad Ali has such a quote unquote fanboy following? And two, Steve's question, what do you believe Ali's legacy is or maybe should be? Yeah, well, you know, I think this is a, that uh, Ken Burns is doing this story is sort of like typical of the way publishing and television and the media work. We, uh, other, other people tell our stories. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said that uh, when other people tell you, if you don't tell your own stories, other people will tell you, tell them for you, and they will degrade, and they will degrade you. So, you know, white uh, authors and a white producer like Ken Burns has a better opportunity to tell a black story than a black person. I had to go to Montreal to get my book published, The Complete Muhammad Ali, because it didn't go along with this, uh, this wave of adulation. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's a typical thing. Uh, what I've done in order to uh, rectify this is to learn other languages. I wrote a book, a novel called Japanese by Spring, which earned me two trips to uh, Japan and to Chinese universities. I wrote a book called Conjugating Hindi, uh, which, in which I talked about the conflict between conservative Indian, conservative Indian intellectuals and Black American intellectuals. I had to mesh the shoes in mine. So I think that uh, I would recommend uh, some of the viewers to read um, The Greatest, Richard, Richard Durham's book, a Black writer who wrote a book about uh, Ali, had access to Ali, which uh, mostly white writers have had access to Ali toward his death, uh, and get another point of view about Ali. Now, in terms of his legacy, Abdul Rahman, I think, was right when he said that nobody would ever have heard of Muhammad Ali had it not been for Elijah Muhammad. And uh, in terms of the Supreme Court decision, even, Justice Harlan changed his mind and voted for to uh, vindicate Ali because he read Message to the Black Man by Elijah Muhammad and uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, which is brought to his attention uh, by his clerks. So I think that uh, when you mention Ali, don't mention the history and the backstory that there would never have been a Muhammad Ali had it not been for the Nation of Islam, despite their flaws. I talk about criminal elements in the Nation of Islam uh, because they recruited in prisons. I've seen people change their lives because they were introduced to the Nation of Islam. So I'm not, you know, a religious person myself. Uh, but I believe that uh, thousands of people enter the middle class because of organizations like the Nation of Islam and the Black Panther Party. But Ali did leave the Nation of Islam, and he left the Nation of Islam in large part because of disenchantment with Elijah Muhammad, just like my, Malcolm X did. And that leads to the next question. Exactly.
who was more of an orthodox teacher, uh, had uh, Muhammad Ali followed him. Now, Elijah Muhammad, I, I asked him, I said, why do you use all this uh, stuff about Fard being, you know, Fard, Muhammad being Allah, uh, spaceships, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I was told that uh, that was a way to recruit the masses. You could not recruit the the uh, masses of people with the Quran. Now, Gordon Parks spent an afternoon with Muhammad Ali. It was all about popular culture, movies, television, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they said this was a recruiting tool. There's a the late Sam Hamoud, who's in this book uh, by uh, Les Payne, that got the National Book Award, and also was a friend of mine. He said that uh, Elijah Muhammad told his father, and Sam Hamoud claims that his father was assassinated because the government feared a coalition between overseas Muslims and Nation of Islam. But he said that Elijah Muhammad said, well, teach my sons orthodox Islam, because he knew that what he was doing was a popular version of it. And uh, so when Wallace came of maturity and succeeded his father, uh, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali was a boxer. He was not intellectual. I mean, he did what he was told. And, you know, when he actually, there is an opinion that he feared the draft board. He feared the nation of Islam more than he feared the draft board. Because these are orders that everybody take that position. Again, though, the historical fact is he split and eventually converted to Sunni Islam. So, I mean, that's the historical fact. It's Muhammad. He followed Wallace Muhammad. This was no conscious decision on his part. The next question that's asked by Joy, and that is, what impact did Muhammad Ali have on Malcolm X when he turned his back on him in favor of Elijah Muhammad? What effect, if any, did this have on his eventual assassination? Uh, Joy, it sealed it. There is a great book titled Blood Brothers, which is about the friendship between Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. And one of the things that I will agree on with Mr. Reed on is that sometimes Muhammad Ali wasn't acting according to his own principles that he was being manipulated and used. And Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad acted between him and Muhammad Ali. They gave him money. I interviewed his second wife, and he said her father gave him money when he was broke. So I think that that's something that should be explored, and we should, Ken Burns should get more from the point of view of the nation of Islam. The, the um, turning away from Malcolm X to the nation of Islam sealed Malcolm X's fate. That's historically irrefutable. One night in Miami, the members of the Nation of Islam who were rarely interviewed because the white authors dismiss them as a bunch of lunatics and fanatics. Their point of view is that Malcolm X was a hypocrite when he brought up this idea about Elijah Muhammad exploiting these women. He knew that. That was no discovery for him. When he went to Mecca and said that he saw white Muslims, he knew there were white Muslims because he attended the United Nations every week. So I'm, I'm just telling you what they say. I, I think one of the things that we can draw from the conversation, both about Ken, the Ken Burns story and the Nation of Islam perspective, is that it is not the story. It is a story. The whole story requires the sum of all the parts, not the perspectives of one person or one group. And that brings us to the final question, I believe. Um, Kay asks, if the panelists have seen One Night in Miami, and what do they think of the portrayal of Ali in the movie? Uh, Dr. Ahmed, I saw you kind of nod your head. Have you happened to see One Night in Miami? I did. I, did. Um, I mean, again, I'm not a historian, so I cannot uh, give a historical perspective on these issues. Uh, but it was one of my favorite movies that I have watched in recent time. Um, it, it showed a very complicated man. Um, and um, 
And I think that's part of Ali's legacy. And for anyone to expect anything different than Ali being a complicated person is, is not fair because he was born in a very complicated time. Uh, under one of the and, and lived under one of the most brutal circumstances in, imaginable uh, in in modern American history. Um, so for him to develop viewpoints, uh, whether he joined the nation as an act of rebellion, some of it could be definitely be attributed to that, but is also leaving the nation and embracing Orthodox Islam or Sunni Islam. Uh, as a, as his way of life, um, has had his had his own evolution in the way he approached religion. Also, the story that I mentioned that when he uh, when he was in uh, Calcutta in uh, in 1990, he was visiting Calcutta, and when the local person brought up the story or brought up the question to him that who is the greatest, who is the greatest, and his reply was. In, if it was the 1960s Ali, he would have said me. But the 1990s Ali uh, says that God is the greatest as an Orthodox Muslim, as a Sunni Muslim, as an Orthodox Muslim, Sunni or Shia doesn't matter, uh, would, would, would say that God is the greatest. Um, so it is without a doubt that uh, traditional Islam, Orthodox Islam played a huge role in shaping who he was in the latter part of his life. And to that extent, I agree with Mr. Reed that he at some level was a rebel, but at some level he was also a conformist because he took whatever the teaching that he was most attracted to, whether it was the nation's teaching when he was with, uh, with Elijah Muhammad or whether it is the teaching of Orthodox Islam when he moved in a different direction with his faith, he took those teachings and shaped his social life, shaped his cultural outlook towards his life, particularly after 9-11, when he talked about being a cultural ambassador, a bridge uh, to, uh, to bridge the misunderstanding that most Americans had about Islam and Muslims. Um, and when he talked about, as his daughter in the, in the, in the documentary was talking about, that uh, he talked about faiths being rivers and, and lakes. But they all contain water. They all contain the truth. Um, that is also part of a very orthodox teaching of Islam, where one of the verses of the Quran says that God says that I made you into nations and tribes so that you may know each other, not despise each other. So the idea that we are all different in colors, in languages, in religions, uh, is part of a divine design. And, and Ali internalized that as he understood the teachings of Islam better, as he progressed through life, which is part of the journey. You know, we should leave the earth a better person than we started our journey. And without a doubt, one has to say that whatever the journey that brought Muhammad Ali to his end, by the end of his life, he was not only a remarkable figure with a remarkable imprint on, on, on the thinking of so many, but he left the world a much better person. Um, and his own journey, his own evolution in faith that brought him to that end point is also very much rooted in Islamic uh, spirituality, uh, which he embraced. He was not just somebody who practiced the, the pillars of Islam. He was not just somebody who was immersed in the rituals of Islam. He did that, but he did more than that. He tried to understand, he tried to embody the spirit of Islam to the best of his ability, including repenting on, on many of his uh, behaviors that would be considered outside the pale of Orthodox Islamic teachings. <clears throat> um, I went to the opening of the Ali Center and I noticed that liquor companies uh, played a big role in financing that center and being the pay liquor companies. I got the program. Uh, so uh, how does that square with Islamic teaching, if you can tell me 
how that squares with a lot of Islamic teaching. Well, I will say that, you know, uh, uh, commercially, <laughs> compromises are made often. I know that we in St. Augustine have uh, uh, monuments to Dr. Martin Luther King that are sponsored by Northrop Grumman. He's not a Muslim, but he was anti-war. And, uh, you know, my, my, my point is here that sometimes our... Being sponsored by liquor companies have to do with Islamic teaching point about compromises that our families make for the sake of preserving legacies. That's the compromise. Yeah. Modern day uh, athletes, you know, their people may, may have uh, sponsorship on their jerseys by companies whose values they may not be uh, supportive of. Uh, it is one of those one of those challenges of modern day living um, that more often than not, we live in the gray zone than in the black and white zone. You know, I, I think a good way to end this would be for each of our panelists to summarize the legacy of Muhammad Ali in one word. As challenging as it is, I challenge the audience to do it as well. One word that comes to mind when you think of Muhammad Ali is what, Mr. Reed? The, the excerpts I've seen from the Ken Burns uh, movie, I think, is uh, an improvement over the Civil Wars, which was narrated by a historian named Shelby Foote, who said that uh, the Ku Klux Klan was like the French Resistance. Uh, so <laughs> so I, I, I look forward to seeing this and, and participating in it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Dr. Ahmed, one word to wrap up the legacy of Muhammad Ali? I would say human, but I will qualify it by saying fully human. Uh, my word was American and all the complexities that that entails. As we bring to a close this great conversation, uh, I would like to let you know that we have a special giveaway for our audience. WJCT Public Media truly values your input. In about 30 minutes, everyone will receive an email with a link to a short survey. Please click on the link and find out where the survey is. And enter for your chance to win a special prize related to Muhammad Ali. Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Reed, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. More importantly, thank you, the audience, for joining us for Ali, Race and Religion. Be sure to tune in to Jack's PBS WJCT on Sunday, September 19th at 8 p.m. for the first round of the new documentary, pun intended. Muhammad Ali by Ken Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon coming to your PBS affiliate. Thank you and good night.